Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Henry Schein Dental Academy webinar series. My name is Adam, Marketing Specialist, and I'll be your moderator. This is the final webinar in our six-part webinar series focusing on treating patients with disabilities. If you happen to miss parts one through five and you would like to watch them or re-watch them, please email webinars at henryshine.com and we will send you the recordings. We're excited to welcome back Dr. Maureen Perry as our speaker today, as she will discuss autism in general, as well as in the dental setting. Before we get started, we have a few reminders. At any point during today's webinar, we do encourage your participation. Please type any questions you have into the Q&A section of your control panel, and we'll answer them live at the end of the presentation. And directly following today's webinar, we're asking that you complete a quick survey to let us know what you thought of the presentation. If you elected to receive CE credit for this webinar, it is required that you complete that survey in order to get your CE certificate. It's also required that you attend this webinar for the entire duration. Your CE certificate will then be emailed to you via the email address provided during registration, and your account will be billed within one to two weeks of today's date. Henry Schein is only able to offer CE credits to doctors licensed and practicing in the United States. If you have questions about CE for this webinar, please email us at webinars at henryshine.com. Dr. Perry, the floor is yours. Today we're going to talk about autism and uh, what's new, what's true, and uh, how do we deal with patients who have autism in the dental chair. Uh, here is my disclosure. I'm being sponsored by Henry Shine for this continuing education session. Uh, this is an ADA SERP activity if you paid for it. And our learning objectives, um, a participant will be able to describe and, and define the term autistic spectrum disorders. Uh, recognize the current epidemiological trends in autism, compare the current theories of the etiology of autism, and apply some management techniques and best practices for treating patients with autism. And we're going to spend quite a lot of time talking about uh, what to do uh, with patients with autism in the dental chair. Um, okay, so I, some of you, if you've seen a lot of, of, if you've seen some of my earlier presentation, you may have seen this, but let's take a look at a very famous person with autism to set the stage. I think I'll start out and just talk a little bit about what exactly autism is. Autism is a very big continuum that goes from very severe, the child remains nonverbal, all the way up to brilliant scientists and engineers. And I actually feel at home here because there's a lot of autism genetics here. You wouldn't have any... Um... It's a continuum of traits. When does a nerd turn into, you know, a... Asperger, which is just mild autism. I mean, Einstein and Mozart and Tesla would all be probably diagnosed as uh, autistic spectrum today. And one of the things that really is going to concern me is getting these kids to, to be the ones that are going to invent the next energy things, you now that Bill Gates talked about this morning. Okay. Now, if you want to understand autism animals, and I want to talk to you about different ways of thinking, you have to get away from verbal language. I think in pictures. I don't think in language. Now, the thing about the autistic mind is it attends to details, okay? This is a test where you either have to pick out the big letters or pick out the little letters, and the autistic mind picks out the little letters more quickly. And the thing is, the normal brain ignores the details. Well, if you're building a bridge, details are pretty important because I'll fall down if you ignore the details. And one of my big concerns with a lot of policy things today is things are getting too abstract. People are getting away from doing hands-on stuff. I'm really concerned that a lot of the schools have taken out the hands-on classes because art and classes like that, those were the classes where I excelled. So that's Temple Grandin, and she has a PhD, and she's written several books. Her book is called Thinking in Pictures, and it gives you a really good insight into the way that people with autism think. It was made into a movie called Temple Grandin, starring Claire Danes. Really uh, good movie. It's probably on Netflix or some streaming service now, if you want to watch that. And uh, it's a re really good book. She's written several books. Uh, so what is autism? It's a spectrum disorder, as she said. It's a pervasive developmental disorder. Uh, where people have excesses and deficits in behavior, and um, it's, it's neurological, it's lifelong, and it's complex, and it's extremely unique to every individual. So uh, when we look at the areas of impairment, the areas of impairment, uh, according to the American uh, Psychological Association in their, their manual, five, 
It's the social communication issues and then repetitive behavior and play issues. So those are the two areas of impairment. Um, so according to this manual, it's a behavioral disorder. We know that uh, there's multiple etiologies. We don't really know, but we'll talk a little bit about some of the theories, uh, genetic and environmental. It's lifelong. Um, there's different appear appearances. So when people are children and when they're adults, their interactions with other people will, will change throughout life, just like everyone else. Uh, it's important to diagnose early so that people can get early intervention and the support they need. And most people will need sustained su support in some aspect of their lives. Um, so when we talk about in early childhood, sometimes people do not um, notice these things or they kind of shrug them off in their own children. Um, and why? Um, because there aren't a lot of social demands on small children. They don't have to sit still or pay attention until they go to school. So once they, uh, the social demands exceed their actual capacity, then we start to see these sort of symptoms. Um, and they limit and impair everyday functioning. And we know they have social communication issues, uh, different uh, deficits in social and emotional reciprocity. So um, the way we might smile at, at somebody or, or smile at, at a stranger walking down the street, um, they may not um, understand that kind of reciprocity, uh, how people communicate and they may communicate in non-verbal ways, right? However, they don't really get the subtle social cues um, of someone say crossing their arms or sort of scowling at them. They don't really pick up on the subtle cues um, that things are not really uh, going well in that conversation. Um, and they may have problems in developing and maintaining relationships. And that really goes to, not to the person with autism, but um, to those of us who, who are neurotypical and don't have autism, um, because we're not good at maintaining relationships with them. <laughs> because we don't really think the same way and we can't figure it out. Um, it's not that people with autism don't want to have a relationship with you, uh, many of them do. Um, so we look at diagnosis and screening. Diagnosis can be done before age two and the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, recommends specific autism screening tools for kids who are under 18 months. Um, and there you see one of my patients and he sort of has what we call flat affect. He's looking at the camera, but he's not smiling and he's sort of not even looking at the camera. He's sort of just staring you down, right? Um, the latest study that I read, only 8% of pediatricians in America will regularly screening for autism. Um, and that's not good, right? Because we want to get early intervention. So I always say uh, with autism, I feel like if you see something, say something. If you see a friend's child or a relative or somebody and they don't seem, they seem to have those red flags. You have to figure out a way to, to bring it up in a, in a nice manner, like, because it's really important for early intervention. You don't really don't want kids to not develop social skills until they get to be five or six and are in kindergarten. Uh, so we think about the stereotypical kinds of patterns that people might do, repetitive street, uh, speech or motor movements, um, excessive adherence to routines, highly fixated or, or uh, interests that really are intense, uh, hyper or hypo reactivity to sensory input. And, um, you know, you think about this and there are some people who are really just into something and we don't think that that's so odd. So someone might have one of these things, but that doesn't mean they have autism. These are just human traits, right? So these, uh, some humans do one of these things or more, but that doesn't necessarily mean they have autism. You have to kind of check all the boxes. Uh, so let's take a look at my friend Dylan here. He's sort of a, 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 he's a teenager. He's an interesting guy. Tell him, if you tell your husband, okay. just don't tell him, don't, you can tell him, but just don't let him tell anyone. Okay, I'll, I'll tell him that it's between us as a married well, couple. I'm not like any other boys, but the reason why, because I'm a I'm an autistic boy. Do you know what that means? I sort of do. But why don't you tell me what it means? Because I'm different and special. I'm different like any other other children. The reason why I'm autistic because I I have different special stuff, special needs, like like something like Tim Will Brandon. He she was like autistic too, but she's the smartest. That's right. And she can't be touched either. Yeah. And she loves animals. She does. Well, the reason why I'm autistic because I like I like being a an adult, 
and also being a child. And that's why I was autistic. I, uh, I like to do what children has done before, like cartoons, comics, DVDs, action figures, drinking soda, and most important, it's hard for me. So that's why I'm setting off to the group home. The reason why I go there, because there's some other people who would try to help me. And that's why I go there, because they're the only ones who will help me. And without them, without my help, I'm useful. So that's why, that's why I act like this. That's why I'm very funny. I pretend not to be autistic, but if, if anyone finds out, then people are not into me anymore. That's why. I'm into you, Dylan. I think you're great. You really mean that? I think you're great. So, you like being autistic? Wait, wait, I'm just saying, do you like when people are autistic? I like when people are who they are and don't pretend to be something else. I guess you're right. I think that that's just... Well, after that, all... That's what makes you real. After all, I am special. You are. And my mom tried to protect me, but... Your mom and dad will always try yeah, to protect you. Yeah, since I'm older, I am responsible to take care of myself. I won't get hurt. I won't run away. I'll just stay who I am. Good. And stay myself in. And I will, and I will go wherever I... Somewhere safe. Somewhere not dangerous. And somewhere nice. And that's how I said... And that's why, as an adult, I'm allowed to be responsible to take care of myself. If any bad guy try to get me, I'll just run away and say, get away from me, or what? I'll just ran. I'll run away from him. And when I ran, then he won't get me. That's why I'm being adult. That's what being an adult is all about. That's, that's right. why I want to be like a real adult. And that's the, we that's the one I'm trying to do. You're doing a great job. So that's why, Mom, I'm very responsible for myself. You want me to become an adult, and that's what I want to do. And that's why, if I'm going to be an adult, I'd rather take care of myself. I get it. So you can protect me as much as you want, but I can just take care of myself at the pizza restaurant. I get it, Dylan. I love you. Okay, you, we'll work it out. I'll set you up with the girls, and then maybe me and Miss Jen will go sit somewhere. Okay. Okay? Deal? Deal. Love you. Thank you, Mom. You're welcome. I love you. After all... I love you. I am a grown-up. I love you, too. <laughs> so I, I love that video because you can really see um, Dylan sort of... He's, he's, you know, struggling with, with being an adult, and you can tell that he's sort of repeating things that his mom probably has said to him and about where he's going to be going, and he's going to be at the group home, and he's going to be okay. Um, and you can see, he, I mean, he has a good level of, of functioning, um, but, you know, he has sort of that stilted talking, and I think, you know, most people would understand after you meet him, after he speaks with you for a few minutes, that that he has a, a disability and that he has autism. And it's it's obvious in, in that. Um, and I show you that because it's easier to do that than explain. Uh, and here we see some, some sort of what I think of as red flags. So we have a little kid who, um, if you have sensory issues, uh, think about what a nightmare Santa would be. He's a total stranger. Uh, he wants to pick you up and he's got that all that velvet on him and that scratchy beard and you don't know him and, and you know, that is just a disaster for a kid with autism. And um, my, uh, my dental assistant has two children with autism and one is, now one is 13 and one is 31. Um, and the, the younger boy, when he went to see Santa, he was about seven and um, he went to see Santa at the mall and, he, and Santa asked him what he'd like. And he told Santa that he would like to have a picnic in the park um, for, for Christmas with his friends and his family, which I thought was really nice, right? He didn't really want something for himself. He wanted to be around his friends and family. So then he goes to see Santa at the mall and Santa says, and what would you like for Christmas? And he said, we already talked about this. 
Like he couldn't get it. Like what was wrong with this Santa? Um, so uh, uh, it, it took him to till he was seven to actually be able to uh, sit with Santa. Um, but he's still not a big fan of the velvet and the scratchy beard. Uh, and we can understand that as sensory overload. Other kinds of comorbid diagnoses people might have, ADHD and learning disabilities, visual and hearing impairments, OCD, uh, developmental disability, uh, fragile X, tuberous sclerosis. Um, not everybody with tuberous sclerosis, obviously, uh, but this, this can be a, a comorbid diagnosis, anxiety, uh, seizures, and depression. Lots and lots of patients that I see and people that I know with autism have sleep issues. So people don't either, they have trouble sleeping or they really don't sleep at all. Um, feeding problems in GI, and we're gonna talk about what that might be related to a little later on. Uh, they may have dental issues um, because they don't like all the sensory stuff that we have to do as dentists. I mean, we're really all up in people's business when you really think about it. It's a very intimate uh, thing that we do and we've got all those tools and things that taste funny and, and um, we're putting stuff all in people's mouths. So people may have issues with that. Uh, Self-injurious behaviors. So people might skin pick or pick their gingiva, things like that. And they still might have other childhood disorders or you know other medical complications. Uh, I love this because we have to remember that once you say something, you can't take it back. So just like my other videos um, that, were, that I like to show, uh, we're going to talk about what not to say to a person with autism. Hi, Purple Ella here. Today I want to talk to you about the things that people say to autistic people that we could live without. Everyone's a little bit autistic, right? Everyone's on the spectrum somewhere though, right? No. Autistic traits are human traits, therefore everyone has some of these traits. It's a particular collection of these traits that leads to the diagnosis of autism. Therefore, if you don't have this particular collection of traits, you don't have autism. Uh, but you don't really look autistic though. My autistic shirt is in the wash. And I forgot to do the autism things that mean that you would know that I was autistic just from looking at me. Should I be... What do I need to do to look autistic? I mean, what the heck? Oh, uh, but you must have very mild autism though. I mean, I made a whole video about this. Shall I give you a link? So, what's your special ability? I can recite lines from friends and eat Jaffa cakes like a pro. I'm really good at watching Netflix. You should see me eat sushi. Yeah, but you must be really good at numbers, right? I mean, I, I don't even have a maths GCSE. So, no. These are all things that people have actually said to me. Not just once, fairly regularly. And I understand that no one is saying these things with ill intention or to hurt me or to be mean. So why do people say these things to autistic people? Number one, discomfort. They have just heard something about someone that they don't know a huge amount about. It feels a little bit uncomfortable. They don't really know what to say. So they say the first thing that comes into their head. And if you don't know loads about autism, you don't look autistic or you might be good with numbers, might be the only thing that you have in your head about autism. So you're gonna say it. It's not meant with ill intention. It's not meant to be mean. It's just what came out. Wanted to reassure you. I think that the comments like, you must have very mild autism and you don't really look autistic, sometimes come from a place of wanting to reassure you that you fit in, you don't stand out, you're not too different, don't worry about it, it's not a big deal. Because we like to minimise things, we like to make people feel better about things, we like to compliment people, and I think the people that say those things think it's a compliment. They think that by saying, you don't really look autistic, or your autism's probably very mild, they are complimenting you on your lack of autism, and your lack of obvious autism. Because it feels to them like that might be a compliment, because they're not fully educated, they're not part of the autism community, they don't really know a huge amount about autism, and so they assume that you would want to be described as being less autistic, and that that would be reassuring and complimentary for you. Like, there's nothing wrong with you, don't worry, you look fine, you're normal, it's okay, because being normal is the goal we're sold, so in reassuring you that you look normal, this is a compliment. They might be uninformed and relying on autism stereotypes. So, uh, many of you who are watching this video, and certainly myself, live in a very autism 
kind of knowledgeable bubble. I am followed by and follow loads of autistic people on. So I just show you that um, she has lots and lots of autism uh, videos, that young lady. And uh, interesting because, you know, you don't want to, in, uh, you have to really start thinking about autism in a different way. And although this presentation is sort of uh, from the medical perspective, I think we have to start thinking about that. You know, people with autism are just different. They think differently um, and they are not what we would call uh, neurotypical, right? That's sort of a, another medical term. Um, but there's no such thing as uh, normal. I don't know, as my um, hygienist uh, Karen always says, uh, normal is a setting on a dryer. So I don't know what normal is, but I've never seen it. So, you know, people with autism just think differently. They're just different kinds of people, just like everyone else on the planet is a different kind of person than you are. So you just kind of have to think of it that way. Um, and here we look at some of the data that uh, in, starting in um, 2000, and we can look at the number of uh, folks that have um, the number of uh, people that maybe have autism um, really, really rising from one in 150 to one in 68, staying fairly um, stable at that point, but really rising in the last 20 years. And that has to tell us something. What is going on here? What is going on in our environment? What is going on genetically? Something is going on to uh, rapidly increase the number of people. Now, granted, we understand that it's a spectrum disorder, so you may see some people at one end or the other, and people can appear uh, very, very different. Uh, we, saw, we saw a few different kinds of people so far that had autism. Okay, so why is the increase? Well, number one, we're better at the diagnosis. Number two, it's a spectrum. So now there's a big broader definition. Um, and we see people who have ASD that have normal intelligence, right? Or even patients, people who have, are, are even super intelligent. So we see people who, if you they were to do an IQ test would come out way above a hundred, which is average. Um, and we see people, um, which we formerly would call Asperger's, that's no longer a diagnosis. New cases are not, are all called uh, autistic spectrum disorder. There's no more Asperger's, but you may meet a person who has it because they were diagnosed when Asperger's uh, uh, was still a diagnosis. So you may meet an adult who has that. When we look at the epidemiology, uh, we see uh, that the male to uh, female ratios vary with IQ. In the moderately impaired, it's a four to one. We see a lot, many, many more boys with autism than girls. And we see at least twice as many boys uh, in people who are um, severely impaired. And you see just a nice picture there. And it's really a funny picture to me because some of the kids look very happy about the Christmas stuff and some of them just couldn't care less and really don't look like they wanna be around at this, uh, this Christmas festivities here. Um, too many people maybe. Uh, what's the ideology of autism? We don't know. You wanted to know what causes autism, you came to the wrong place today, because I do not know. Um, I've read lots and lots on this. I've spent uh, probably the last 20 years being really uh, a really uh, avid reader of, of the uh, literature on autism and, and what might be causing autism. And we know that there's something genetic. We, they've talked about neurotransmitters. Could it be infection? Could it be a metabolic error? Uh, could it be immunologic? Could it be lead poisoning? Lots of different theories. Um, have come up over the last 20 years or so. Um, this is from 2008, uh, but uh, it's it's interesting because this is the first one that I saw and I remember reading it saying that ASD is my, likely multifactorial in etiology. We know there's genetic factors and <coughs> pardon me to a lesser extent, environmental factors. Mm, we know that they're related, but I don't know if it's a lesser extent. So, what do we know about the genetics of it? Well, in monozygotic twins, so that's one egg, right? So that's, um, uh, those are um, identical twins. And identical twins, if one twin has autism, 92% of the time, the other twin has it. In dizygotic twins, right? In dizygotic meaning um, two eggs, right? So fraternal twins, 10%. And so it makes sense that the sibling recurrence is somewhere between two and 8%, right? Because dizygotic twins are no more uh, genetically related than brothers and sisters or brothers and brothers or sisters and sisters. And that's just uh, 
pictures of, of my friends I talked about before. That's uh, Marcus and Lucas, and that was a Christmas photo. We could not get them to uh, to look at the uh, <laughs> to look at the camera, but at least they're hugging. Uh, they don't either one look real comfortable hugging either, so the touching wasn't so good. Um, now Lucas is is he's he's more of a hugger now. Uh, Marcus is the older son is still not a big hugger. I've known him most of his life. He still doesn't want to hug me, but he does talk with me. Um, Lucas is much more uh, amiable and and he likes to talk. Uh, he'll shake your hand. He's 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 13, so he likes to shake hands. He's um, an expert on the presidents of the United States. That's sort of his thing. Um, Marcus is, uh, uh, he's a lovely young man. He also has a developmental disability besides his autism. So he struggles a little bit more, uh, but um, really great kids and uh, fun to be around. What else about the genetics? Well, we know that there are multiple genes uh, involved in this, uh, but we really don't know what they are. Um, we've been starting to identify them in the last 15 years or so, uh, but we're really not sure exactly how this, uh, how this constellation of symptoms appears. I'll tell you this, there's no evidence that vaccination is a postnatal risk for ASD. I'll say it over and over and over again, okay? We can talk about, it. I'm sure someone will ask me a question about this later on, but there is no evidence that any vaccination is a risk to, create, to, to develop autistic spectrum disorder. Uh, so this is an interesting paper. This appeared in 2014, uh, talking about genes in the environment and interactions in ASD and, and about epigenetics. Um, and they said there's no single uh, a major environmental factor has been identified, uh, but we know it's genes times environment, right? We know that that is what's going on here. Um, and we're trying to figure out what does that mean? Well, in 2016, uh, we said, we know it's strongly genetic in origin. Remember, we talked about the twin studies, um, but we're looking at what is the environmental influences on the emergence and the subsequent developmental course of ASD? Why do people, you know, why are some people have autism and some people don't? One of the emerging theories is gut micro microbiota and autism. So there's a huge amount of evidence leaking, linking intestinal microbiota with ASD. And they demonstrated differences in the composition of gut bacteria between children with ASD and children without, right? The controls, the intestinal bacteria have been observed in abundance are um, <coughs> part of Clostridium and Sudorella genus. Um, and by the way, uh, those are bacteria that we find in the food chain. Uh, particularly in cows. Uh, so we see lots and lots of, of uh, maybe it's entering there at the, in the food chain. Maybe that's where, where, where um, the bacteria is getting into uh, the human um, genome. Uh, animal models suggest that certain microbial shifts in the gut may produce changes consistent with the clinical picture of autism. So in other words, we look at, uh, at short chain fatty acids, things like uh, propionic acid, and building up toxicity, much like people who have, say, uh, phenylketonuria, right? You'll see on the back of a Pepsi can or Coke can, it'll say may contain PKU. So uh, phenylketone, uh, phenylketones um, will build up in folks who have PKU and, and that can cause a developmental disability. It's a toxin for them. And so maybe for some people, uh, having too much propionic acid, and uh, if they if this is the gut bacteria they have, maybe that uh, creates a toxic situa situation, and then you get metabolic and immunologic abnormalities. And an easy way to think about this, if this seems far fetched to you, is to think about things like diabetes, right? So uh, a simple uh, thing like diabetes, if you don't, if you're unable to um, uh, to break down your your glucose. Uh, what happens if you don't have any insulin and, and you don't break down your glucose, what happens, right? You can have uh, changes, macular degeneration, you can have end organ disease, you can, uh, you can get neuropathy, right? So many, many things happen as a result of that one uh, era in metabolism. So this, this is possible, right? Then when we look at the animal models, they're extremely suggestive of this. However, you know, an animal model is not identical to the human condition. So we, we haven't seen human studies. So, 
So what do we do when a person with autism comes to our office, right? So now we understand a little bit about the etiology, the epidemiology, uh, but what's going on with a real person? So what we do is we use a welcome packet. We have pictures of our dental team. We have pictures of the office, the parking lot, the entrance, reception, uh, all the stuff that we have around. We used to have toys, which we don't anymore. <laughs> we don't have anything in our waiting room. Uh, age appropriate materials, right? Uh, we've created a social story and I'll show you what, what that is about visiting the dentist. Um, we also let uh, the, the guardian or the person know the policies and procedures um, regarding you know, that person and, and how we deal with uh, people coming in and out of our clinic, especially in the days of COVID, we do allow uh, parents or caregivers to come in as long as they meet the screening, uh, they pass the screening. Um, and then we have a form that reminds patients to think of, uh, and, and their parents or caregivers to write a list of questions if, that they have for us so that when they come in, we, we, we spend a lot of good time together. Uh, now we are using a lot of teledentistry for our new patients. So we may do all of this over um, teledentistry and show them, a, show them the video of the clinic and talk with the patient and the caregiver or parent um, about all these questions, medical history, uh, emergency contacts that may all be done even before they come physically to the clinic in a teledentistry visit. Uh, we have all the forms completed and we review them in advance. Um, we have specific behavioral questions on there, uh, talk about things that your, the person with autism likes or doesn't like, um, what's highly motivating, you know, what, what do they really like, you know, uh, I have one, one boy who, if I have to watch Nemo one more time, it always seems to be on the same part of the story. I don't know, maybe he just watches that one, that, that one series of scenes over and over, but I seem to be watching a lot of Nemo with him. Um, we have other people who like, uh, we have these little like bright lights that spin around and some people like those. Um, for people who are nonverbal, we also, we always ask um, moms and dads or caregivers, how, how do they make their needs known? Can they, do they sign? Uh, so my friend Marcus signs. Uh, uh, he's fluent in ASL, does he sign? Uh, do they use an iPad? Do they use pictures? Do they do a communication boards? How do, how do they let you know what they need? Um, here's an example of a social story. And uh, this is not our university, but another university that developed this and you can see the outside and then the Center for Pediatric Dentistry where they check in and looking at um, what the clinic looks like, what, you know, and you could either do a video um, or you can do pictures, a traditional social story, but you could do a social story video for your practice. Um, and then we kind of show them exactly what will happen. And I'll sit in the chair, the dentist will check my teeth. Um, they'll put on their gloves and masks and, 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 and now shields, right? We'll put on everything and then they'll check our teeth and I will open my mouth wide so they can see me. And, and then at the end it says, I did a great job at the dentist and now it's time to leave. So this is what a social story looks like, really useful for um, people with any kind of developmental disability, but particularly good for people with autism who really want to know what's going to happen before they get anywhere um, and really like the whole idea of being familiar with things um, and sameness. And so one of the things that is good is if you just do, we did a, we just did a little quick, uh, iPhone video, we walked through the clinic and we talked about it very slowly and described the clinic. And then we, you can post it and people can go look at it. And I think it's also nice for other people to see where, where they're going to. I think it'd be great if I knew where I was going at my doctor's office um, and I knew who I was gonna meet when I got there. Working with your office staff. So again, you have to educate the whole office staff from the receptionist to dental assistants and make sure it's a, a full, full court press. Everyone's gotta be on board, everyone's gotta be trained everyone's got to be compassionate. Um, so again, we see people coming into the clinic and you can kind of see mom's feeling a little leery and one of our residents goes out and talks with the little girl and is convincing her by reading her a door story that she should, she should come back in the back of the clinic. So she's kind of, kind of bribing her a little bit, like come along this way and we'll show you. Um, so practical uh, approaches. Um, so we tell patients, you know, put your hand on your stomach, right? Whatever you want to first. Then we're talking about like here, kids, uh, putting your feet out straight, open your mouth wide, hold your mouth open. Uh, they may want to clean with a power brush. We've tried that um, with, with patients, see if they like it. And then taking x-rays. So very simple, clear cut examples of uh, how you should talk with a patient.
we do tell, show, do. Uh, we don't use negative reinforcement. We do positive reinforcement. You might do negative reinforcement if somebody does something that's dangerous and tell them no, like don't do that. Um, but we do use positive reinforcement um, and you need to be flexible. We use modeling. So if the patient has a sibling or a parent or a caregiver with them, we uh, will say, okay, so this is what will happen. You'll get in the chair just like your brother did or your sister and uh, oh, wow, they got in the chair. That's great. Now let us count your teeth. That's wonderful. Um, and you know, we count slowly and then we use clear, short, simple sentences. And I basically ignore inappropriate behavior unless it's dangerous. That's usually, so inappropriate behavior is usually an escape mechanism where people know they've learned that if they act a certain way that you, know, you won't know what to do and they'll, you'll just let them leave. So um, we don't generally do that. So here is a nice young lady who's never been to our clinic before and one of our uh, dental students who's going to, to talk with her. So this is uh, Eleni, and she's never been to the dental clinic before. Do you have brothers and sisters? Yes. Younger or older? Eleni. Younger. All right, wait. Are your brother and sister older or younger than you? Older. <laughs> I'm smaller and bigger. So, so that's interesting. So that's Eleni and, and you can hear her mom is, is prompting her and she kind of has some stereotypical behavior there where she's not really looking at the doctor and she's playing with the phone and, um, but she does something that many people with autism can do, which is being very, very literal. So she asks her, do you have brothers and sisters? And she says, yes, but she doesn't give you any more information. And she says, well, I have a brother and a sister. And then she says, are they older or younger? And then Eleni says, well, older, no younger. She can't really decide. That's sort of interesting. I mean, she's a kid, she's 10 years old here. Most kids would know they have older or brother or younger siblings. And um, the thing that's so interesting about that is that, uh, is that Eleni's a triplet. <laughs> and you would think that if you were a triplet, you might say, oh, I'm a triplet, right? That's sort of interesting. But many people with autism, it's like very literal. But you didn't ask me if I was a triplet. You asked me if I have brothers and sisters. I answered your question. So it's sort of very interesting because she's so super literal here. Um, and let's see how she does when we want to um, get her out of the chair. And watch her reactions. I'm not using. Okay. All right. You ready to take some pictures? Yes. Let's let this load while we take you the pictures. Oh, okay. All right. Who do you I'm going to have you take your glasses off, okay? Thank you. Um, Thanks for coming in and hanging out with me. We are so much fun. All right, Lane, you ready to hop out and take some pictures? Oh, are you doing all right? So some of the things that I don't think went so great in that is that they took away the phone way too early. <laughs> they weren't ready to get her up or out of that chair. Uh, and they weren't ready to take the x-rays and they took her distraction away. And you start, you start to see that she sort of gets the, the Mexican jumping beans, the ants in the pants. She's moving all around. She's not, she can't really self, you know, control, right? So she doesn't have good self-control. She can't self-manage. She can't just sit there. She's very anxious. Um, I wouldn't have taken the phone away. I would have waited until we were ready. And I also wouldn't say, we're going to take x-rays. Okay, I never ask patients. I just tell them what we're gonna do. We're taking x-rays. Come with me, or please come with me. Open your mouth, close your mouth. Okay, command form, because what are you going to do when the patient says, no, I don't wanna take x-rays? <laughs> so don't ask them. You sort of just have to tell them because there's always that op opportunity for the patient to say no. And then where are you gonna go with that? So um, I, I don't usually say, okay. I just say, we're going to take x-rays. Uh, some of the things you can try, desensitization, which is repetitive conditioning. And uh, I am not, this is a, not an endorsement. The, this is just a company that, that does actually have this, uh, this. And you can try this determined program. It's one of many uh, on the market. Um, um, so there, you, know, you can Google them, but um, sort of just doing the same things over and over again. And here we see somebody be desensitizing one of our little kids just by counting. 
Okay, we're just gonna count your teeth, nothing up my hands, nothing up my sleeves, right? Just my hands, no, no sharp materials and just, um, just counting teeth and getting us to cooperate with that. Uh, and then the patient being really proud that she was able to do that. Um, desensitization takes a lot of manpower and uh, time and there's financial concerns about whether you can get it reimbursed. We do have our patients, if they wanna come in, uh, we, we have certain times because we're dental school where we don't actually use the clinic. Um, so we will set up appointments for them and our assistants and our hyg uh, hygiene team will often uh, put them in the chair, count their teeth, let them ride up and down in the chair, let them see the clinic if they want. So we do, uh, we do, we do sort of uh, just friendly visits um, and, uh, and, and we can also do them um, at lunchtime. So we will also sometimes schedule those at lunchtime so that people can um, you know, and it wouldn't be normal chair time, and then we can let people see what it's like to come to the dentist. Um, again, we never ever use negative reinforcement. It's a bad idea. Nobody likes to be yelled at. Um, so again, letting the patient sit in the chair, using a toothbrush to add the patient open their mouth. I've never given a patient a toothbrush or come near a patient with a toothbrush and they stuck it in their ear. Patients know what it is. Um, I don't touch the patient. I always just put my hand out and see if the patient will touch me. I let them touch me first. Uh, I wanna see what they're, if they have tactile issues. Um, we don't want sensory overload, which is always a joke, right? Because the dental clinic is filled with sensory overload. So we usually do use a quiet room. We have uh, six quiet rooms in our clinic. We use a quiet room. Um, short, organized appointments. Um, don't make the patient hang out in the waiting room or waiting in the car these days with COVID. Uh, we don't do that. Um, we got to try and get the patient in. Like, you know, the patient's going to be there, be ready. Uh, we do use the same room, same personnel as much as we can. Uh, people like routine. I have news for you. Everyone likes routine. I'm going to, I just want you to think about yourself. And when you go to work in the morning, if you don't have a designated spot, do you like to park in the same spot? I do. I like to park in the same spot. I don't know. I feel like the day's going to be good if I do that. See, it's a human trait. It's not an autistic trait, but humans have lots of traits where we like things the same, or we are sensitive, or we don't like certain things. There's certain foods we don't like because of the texture. There's certain people who don't wanna to touch things like velvet. There are certain people who eat and they don't want their food to touch. These are all human kind of things, but when you put them all together, you see that these are what we call traits of autism, right? But we all have these. We all have these little things that we do. However, we're really good at hiding them. If we think that they're weird or they're not socially normal, we will um, hide them and, and we will um, self-manage, right? So if, if you really wanna pitch a fit about something, but you know it's inappropriate, you're able to self-manage and not do that. Um, we talk about deep touch and, and being wrapped up. And some people like, uh, and we see these now, these weighted blankets, lots of people like them. Uh, we do have uh, things like that in our clinic and some people like them. So if people wanna have a weighted blanket or be wrapped up in a, a sheet or something and that makes them more comfortable and feel safe, we do that too. Um, we don't do any sudden movements. Everybody's easily distracted. Uh, it's a teaching institution, but we try not to crowd our patient, not too many people around. A lot of people around tends to not be a comfortable situation for people with autism. Um, you know, Don't shine light in anybody's eyes. That's not a practice builder. Uh, at home rehearsals. Um, and please, you know, compassion and empathy for parents and caregivers and for the patient. This is only one part of what the whole family is dealing with. Uh, okay. Um, and again, sameness, everybody likes sameness. People like routine. Uh, we may see some behavioral challenges like short attention span, uh, routines, hyperactivity. People are easily frustrated. They might have a tantrum. Again, this all goes to the inability to sort of self-manage and and react what we think would be appropriately. Um, and echolalia, which is just repeating things. Um, some of the things that we see that are common in children with autism is bruxism or non-nutritive chewing. So chewing on things, uh, tongue, tongue thrusting. We talked a little bit about self-injury, erosion. So we see lots of patients who regurgitate. Again, you have to wonder if this goes back to the GI issues and the propionic acid issues, short chain fatty acid. Um, many of these kids have GI issues um, and have limited diet, uh, you know, dietary preferences. Uh, there are people who only eat like one or two things. But I bet if you think about it, I bet you can figure out somebody in your own life or someone you know who really has a really limited diet and only eats a couple of things. Um, and uh, as an adult, which, you know, 
is is a little bit different, but we don't think like, oh, they have autism. But many kids with autism, it's a it's a ask people around, ask your ask your uh, your family when they don't like something. What is it about that food they don't like? Is it the texture? Is it the smell? There's usually other things. It's sort of an interesting uh, topic. So caries, we don't get more caries because you have ASD, right? Um, but we do. <laughs> Lots of parents use uh, food as a reward. Um, so that's a problem. And if people really have behavioral challenges, you know, oral hygiene may be an issue at home. So when I have folks in the chair, I always say, show me how you do it at home. I tell all my patients that. I don't care if you have a developmental disability or not. Show me how you brush your teeth at home. Show me how you floss, okay? Because then I can say, okay, well, here's what we need to improve. This is the issue. And you can help people. Um, it, you know, have better oral hygiene. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, what professionals, other professionals, behavioral uh, therapists can do to help us and help our patients in the dental chair. So you may have heard of this before, Applied Behavioral Analysis, ABA. It's a scientific approach for improving important social behaviors, right? Uh, and it's validated, it's been around since the 60s, and it's really about uh, getting desired behaviors through positive reinforcement, and, and what we call chaining small tasks into small manageable components. In other words, first we sit in the dental chair, then we put the dental bib on, then we open our mouth, then we brush the teeth. So, so you know, doing one thing, then another, then one, two, three, then one, two, three, four. Mm. It's very intense. So I'm gonna show you a picture. He's a friend of mine. This was a, a training that we did. And this is the first time he's ever been at the dentist. He's 11. And let's see how he does the first time. He's nonverbal, but he's certainly expressing his anxiety, right? So again, we give Leo a toothbrush and uh, he looks at it, he knows what to do. He's kind of chewing on it, but he knows what to do with it. Yeah, there's still there. That was it? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, he's not too interested. He's going to go back to the phone. Yeah. Uh, what he has around his neck is a communication device, but he doesn't want to use it. He thinks that that's uh, for washing his face. He's showing us that he thinks that, that the dentist wants to wash his face with that. So he, he didn't understand what it was for. So again, a real challenge. Now, because we were filming and this was a training um, video, uh, this patient had never been there, he'd never been at the clinic. He'd never met any of these people. So you can see the amount of anxiety he's had and he wasn't really prepared. We didn't use a social story. He wasn't prepared. His parents didn't know what was gonna happen when he got to the clinic. Um, and so there's a lot of anxiety there. Let's see what happens when he goes home. So we have him working with his therapist at home. So you see, that's the first point. So hands on the belly, and then he gets to watch his, his iPad. So he has to put his hands down to get his reward. So this is the chaining part. So now we laid down, we put our hands on our belly and we opened our mouth. So one, two, three. So this is what the behavioral therapist will do if you are working with them and they are, um, and they are helping you uh, to train your patient. And that's Leo's mama. She gives him a high five. He likes it. Open your mouth, Leo. Open your mouth. 
And that's a little spin brush that we're using. And you see they're holding up and, and look how, how, how well he's doing. He's keeping his mouth open. He's got his hands down. He's doing great and we're giving him positive reinforcement. So we're gonna go to the end a little bit here. We'll skip over and now we've got him in a chair. And you see now we can at least get his bib on and sit and open our mouth. And we're counting. So we give him a time and he knows how long it's going to be. And now you see she has a glove on. And she's touching his face and desensitizing him. So that's eight weeks. That's eight weeks of practice at home three times a week. Do the math. That's 24 sessions with the therapist. Now realize that many children who are enrolled in, um, in school will have access to ABA. Many children who are involved, uh, enrolled in programs outside of school and community-based programs will also have access. So now we're gonna see Leo. We're bringing him back to the dental clinic for his cleaning after eight weeks. By the way, not a total success because you can see we didn't get him off the soda. Um, <laughs> so um, that, that was gonna be the next thing for the ABA therapist is uh, getting him off the soda. Now, see, we're definitely leaving Leo in the waiting room too long here. And he's playing with his game. We're going to bring him in now. Now, we're going to bring Leo right back, and we're going to put him in the same chair. We have the same hygienist and we do have the same assistant, um, but we have different providers because it's the dental school. So that's always a challenge for us. So we get Leo to sit in the chair. Again, here's a mistake. We should definitely be more ready than this. <laughs> but Leo's pretty excited about being there. He's not crying. And so Karen's taking him for a ride in the chair. That's our hygienist. And he seems more relaxed. And he likes that. He likes that. He likes the attention. He's doing better. So Karen is distracting him. Our hygienist is distracting him while the doctor's getting ready. And then we're going to show you what, what happens next. So again, we left him using his, his phone and his assisted device so that he would continue to, to be engaged with that until we're ready. What he's doing is he's looking over to the right because the computer's there and he sees the odontogram and he's touching it. Now remember, he didn't really like having this on before. And again, he remembers what he's supposed to do. And he's doing a very good job there. 
but you can hear all the noise in the background. It's not exactly a quiet place. And you see Karen is counting so he knows when it's going to be over, which is a really good strategy. And so while Karen is counting to five, the doctor is looking at the teeth on the opposite side, right? And doing a visual exam. And that's how we're, and that's how we're getting the exam done. So you can see that luckily Leo did not have any visible caries. He was in mixed dentition, so he had lots of spacing. And we were able to see that he did not have any visible caries. Um, we did not get x-rays on Leo. <laughs> we were able to get a visual exam, uh, a, a toothbrush prophy, um, a head and neck exam, and, and that was it. Um, you know, I think the ABA is wonderful for, for, for that. Um, you may not ever get a, a child like Leo to be able to cooperate fully if you needed to do, you know, a filling or something that required drilling on him. That might be really difficult. But our take home message is if you've seen one patient with autism, we've seen one patient with autism. Just like everyone on the planet, everyone is different. So you will have to try lots of these tips and tricks to see how the patient does. Uh, these are some useful um, information guides. Uh, and they're right here. It's called the autismcenter.org. And these are free. You can download them. They're also in, they're in English and in Spanish. Um, and I was part of the team that developed them that, along with Delta Dental. It was from a grant from them. And you can go ahead and, and use these. There's one for dental professionals, one for autism professionals, and one for families and caregivers. Very useful stuff. Lots of resources out there. You guys have the web. You can find tons of them. Um, I thank you so much for listening today. I apologize for my uh, problems that I had, but um, I'm open to taking any questions for anyone uh, who's still on, because <laughs> I know we went over a little. Yes, we did. We got quite a few people on. So if anyone does have any questions you'd like Dr. Perry to answer, feel free to drop them in the chat or q and um, I've only got one for you so far, so we'll, we'll roll with that. Um, my four-year-old grandson is autistic and has had a feeding tube since he was 18 months old and only received nutrition via the tube. He has severe oral aversion syndrome and we're unable to brush his teeth, which are starting to have issues. He will occasionally sip water though. Should we be giving him fluoride drops in his pediasure through his tube? Hmm. You know, I've never... It's interesting. You should probably ask the pediatrician about that. Um, and if he's drinking water, you might want to not use bottled water, but water that has fluoride in it, um, if he's able to, to drink. But I would ask the pediatrician about that because I'm not sure about the absorption if we are putting it in the drops into the G-tube. Um, you might also try uh, using other things. I don't know if he'll let you put, does he let if you put anything in his mouth? If he doesn't let you put anything in his mouth, He's probably, as he gets a little older, going to need some ABA in order to, to get him to be able to brush his teeth and maybe take some nutrition by mouth. Um, but yeah, I would, I would definitely talk to the pediatrician about the fluoride thing. I, I don't know the answer offhand, but I I'm, I'm definitely want to look it up now. <laughs> Nobody's ever asked me that. It's interesting. There's a first for everything. Um, would you mind flipping back to the resources slide again, please? Sure. Thank you. Um, I got all sorts. There's some websites. You want to take pictures? I don't yeah, I'm not not sure what slide they were referring yeah. to, but um, we'll start with that one. We'll start with that one. Oh gosh, of course my thing doesn't want to go. My computer really does not want to cooperate. Does not like you today. It does not. Um, so here's some of the really good um, online ones. Um, SCDA <clears throat> online. Um, our American uh, AAD. MD online, uh, autism speaks on, uh, .org, um, really some good resources online. Uh, lots of stuff about autism online. 
Um, this is one of those things, and here's a couple of really good books. Most of these are by people who have autism. Um, I would recommend that when you read things online about autism, use really good sites. Use sites like that are .edu sites, right? Uh, educational sites or .org, uh, so nonprofit sites. Uh, I would stay away from the .coms. Uh, there's a lot of nonsense out there uh, about you know um, things that are simply not true. So when you're reading them, read them with a critical eye. Um, even studies, you should read with a critical eye. You know, how many people are in the study? Is this a reputable source? Um, are there other explanations for 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 what they're what they're claiming? Um, there's one is one thing really connected to the other. Uh, we often see people writing conclusions that have nothing to do with the results of the study, whether they might be true or not. They still don't have to do with the study. So be very careful what you read. Um, okay. Uh, there are other books. Um, uh, this is a great book, Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. Um, and some of these other ones, they, these are, many of these are written by people with uh, autism. So, um, yeah. Perfect. Um, what about silver diamine use on kids? Yeah, we use a lot of SDF in the clinic on adults and on children. Um, we will do it in, in, you know, for kids, we'll, we'll do it a lot, uh, uh, particularly on primary teeth when we know they're going to fall out. We're just trying to buy some time and hold some space. Um, and we will do it on adults, particularly if someone comes in and they've just got rampant caries. And we're trying to kind of what I think of is put the fire out. Uh, and then what we might do is go back and then, you know, do some more restorative but we're afraid if we start doing major restorative, we'll never get to all the teeth. And by the time we get to the, you know, all the teeth, some of them might need root canals or be extracted. So, so we, we do use it quite often. Do you have any tips on how to manage dental trauma for autistic patients who are uncooperative? <laughs> yes, that is always a joy. So yeah, um, I'm just gonna say that it's very difficult when somebody with autism is riled up to kind of get them to calm down. Um, many times, unfortunately, when that happens, we either have to sedate the patient so we can carefully, uh, you know, either suture them, put the avuls tooth back in. Uh, sometimes we're, we're bonding the teeth together, we're splinting them. So sometimes we do have to sedate the patient. And other times we will use medical immobilization. We have very large papoose boards um, in our clinic that will hold up to like an adult sized person, like a person who's like 300 pounds. Um, and, and we will, if we cannot sedate them or we don't have the ability or we can't get them someplace to sedate them, we will um, put the person in a papoose board to take care of the trauma, okay? Um, so it's not a great, um, I guess either, you know, I'd rather sedate the patient if it's possible, um, but it's really Im impossible unless you can get the patient still, right? Because when you're dealing with trauma and sutures and evulsions, you, you, the patient's got to be still for you to do your work correctly. What are some of the precautions for sedating autistic patients for dental treatment if they are taking medication? Yeah, you know, that's really based on the medications, right? It doesn't have anything to do with the autism. Uh, it just has to do with the medications. We have a pretty uh, strict protocol. We will send out a form to the uh, patient's physician, say this is what we this is what we were told the patient is on. Is this what the patient is on? Uh, is there any reason that we shouldn't sedate the patient that we don't know? And uh, we have a dental anesthesiologist, so we don't we don't sedate uh, anybody without the dental anesthesiologist being there. Um, we don't do a whole lot. We don't do oral sedation. Um, we do some anxiolysis for adults who understand the goal of treatment. We'll use some halcyon and some, some nitrous sometimes. Uh, but for patients who don't understand the goal of treatment, who, who are not cooperative, um, we, don't, we, don't, we don't mess around with oral sedation. We will sedate the patient. We'll start a line because uh, I want to be able to rescue the patient and I don't want to keep giving somebody oral sedation. Uh, so, so we don't use, um, like for kids, we don't do oral sedation like that. We just use IV sedation so we can rescue them. Uh, one, more one more resource request. What was the website for the materials to help train the dental team that you flashed? I think it was on the screen with the three oh, images. Yeah, so um, yeah, there's some, there's two called, there's one called the Determined Program, D-T-E-R-M-I-N-E-D, -dash 
T-E-R-M-I-N-E-D, uh, out of, uh, and that's out of Tufts University. Um, and there's another one, um, sort of a desensitization sort of one um, that is from Texas. And I'm trying to think it's called Bite and Brush. Perfect. Uh, thank you for all the questions, everyone. Got a couple more here. Um, how do children with autism respond to nitrous oxide oxygen? You know, just like everybody else, sometimes they do good and sometimes they don't. <laughs> um, I can never predict when patients are going to do well with nitrous, especially kids. So um, because it's a, a, a situation where you have to put the mask on um, and, and some patients just won't tolerate the mask. So I will try and I'll, I'll tell a patient we're going to put their elephant nose on if it's a child or we're just going to put the nose on and we'll hold the nose there. Or we, sometimes we give the, the nitrous mask to the parent and say, bring this home and just hold it on their nose for a few seconds to see if we can get them to do it. Um, but you know, some patients do well with it and some patients rip it right off. So that's something you have to try. It's not one size fits all with autism, pretty much ever. We've got a comment here from Mindy, open to your interpretation if you'd like. She says, many autistic individuals like and utilize weighted blankets. One thing that I used to, to consistently use is the lead apron for radiology to make an individual more comfortable and feel secure. Oh yeah, we use that too. We only have so many lead, you know, we only have so many uh, weighted blankets. So we use the, the lead apron um, if that's what we have. Uh, yeah, and, and you know, you can use whatever the patient's comfortable with. You know, we have some patients that come in with certain things that they like and we let them use whatever, you know, as long as it's not interfering with what I'm doing uh, from a, you know, dental um, treatment wise, I'll let the patient do anything, I don't care. Uh, let's see, she added again, many autistic individuals have disordered breathing like mouth breathers and do not tolerate nitrous oxide or even 100% oxygen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. A lot, anybody who's a mouth breather is not a good candidate um, for nitrous, right? Because they just blow it right off. So uh, yeah, like, and this really, thank you for making my point that everyone's an individual. <laughs> I was gonna say, I'm, I'm a mouth breather. <laughs> uh, all right, I think that'll wrap it for us today. So first of all, Dr. Perry, thank you uh, for the lecture today. And secondly, I just wanna say it's been a privilege working with you and learning not just more about individuals with disabilities, but also how to treat them in the dental setting. I think this is an area of dentistry that is potentially overlooked by many. So on behalf of Henry Shine, and I'm sure everyone who's attended any of the six webinars, thank you for everything you do and providing the insights that you do, especially in these webinars. Thank you. Um, uh, you're so welcome. I really uh, enjoyed it. I enjoyed working with you guys and I thank Henry Shine for the sponsorship and the ability to, to you know, reach so many people. Uh, I think it's super important and uh, thank you for asking me. Absolutely, you are always welcome back. Um, and then of course, thank you to everyone for attending this webinar or any of the previous five in the series. As I did mention at the beginning, if you missed parts one through five and would like to watch them, please email webinars at henryshine.com and I will gladly send the recordings your way. Thank you all for joining us and have a great evening. All right, thanks.